because the, the hyperbitcoinization will happen in a 24 hour period, if you don't already have Bitcoins at the beginning of that 24 hours, every single minute, every single hour that you are late to try and get Bitcoin during that 24 hour period, you might be buying Bitcoin at double the price of the previous hour, triple the price of the previous hour, 10x, 100x the price of the previous hour. And you are forced to do something that you've never done before in your life because you've never owned BSV. You've never known where to go buy BSV, whatever it's called, Bitcoin, right? You never, never done this action. So you, you, you're not going to catch like the, the, the move. Whereas on FTX, you've done withdrawals before, you go there and withdraw, you, you might have a chance. So again, the best, the best case scenario is just have some Bitcoin now. And then just let it go to zero if it goes to zero. And then life will continue the way we've known it. What up, vigilantes? I am I have the pleasure to introduce to you guys someone who is really unlike many in crypto. I would say that he's one of a kind. Uh he has his own pedigree, and he is the uh the complete opposite of SBF, if you were to describe him in a nutshell. He believes in on-chain scaling. SBF believed in off-chain scaling. He has experience working in some of the biggest exchanges in the world. He's worked at Kraken as managing their strategy, at Circle, at OKX. And I'm here with the one and only Jack Lou. How are you, Jack? How are you doing today? How's it going, Raphael? I'm doing good. So I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. Being that, you know, you, you've you've been generous to take this this interview and this time, because as you well know, um, a lot of people that understand how the exchanges work and what's happening ever since the debacle with the FTX, they don't want to speak. You're probably one of the only individuals that understands the world of crypto exchanges inside and out, and you're here willing to speak with us to give us insights as to. What happened? Why did it happen? Can it happen again? And overall, I want to talk. I wanted to get your overall take, your meta analysis on the entire crypto space as it is. Welcome, Jack. Let's get into it. So, what happened with uh, with FTX? What happened with FTX, and how how is it that such a big exchange went under? where you've been involved in many exchanges that have never gone under. Mm. Yeah, fortunate enough, I, I can't speak to the day-to-day -day -day operations these days of the exchanges I've worked at in the past, but certainly like I've always worked for founders that were very crypto native. If you think about Jesse Powell and when he got into Bitcoin, it was like 2011. Uh, if you think about Jeremy Allaire uh, being in to Bitcoin back in 2013 at the very latest. Um, these are, so it starts you from, okay, these are very much technologists, right? And I think that Bitcoin or crypto is fundamentally a technology with its own sort of economics rule set. But one of the first things that you can do with this technology is you can trade, you can have exchange. But what happened is like as exchange exchanges professionalized, there was this new wave of people that did not look at crypto as a technology. They looked at it more like a financial instrument. And, um, you know, this is the whole Wall Streetization of uh, the exchanges. And I think um, some of the schematics that have been deployed, if you look at some of the backgrounds of these people, and by the way, I speak as someone who uh, used to work at Barclays Capital on the trading floor. Uh, that was my first job uh, out of school as an equity derivative salesperson. Um, and so I'm very much like as someone who studied economics and finance in college during the time of Lehman Brothers. It was very clear to me that like Bitcoin and crypto both have the ability to solve some of the things that led to Lehman Brothers, yet it can also manifest something uh, as large as Lehman Brothers, if not worse. And I think that if you look at some of the backgrounds of the people that ran 3AC, that ran FTX, 
uh, that run DCG that is now in the hot seat. Uh, we don't know at this moment whether they will uh, collapse or not. But there were certain characters that Duffy came in, maybe intentionally damaged uh, with, with the idea, um, or maybe naively thought that they could apply some of the Wall Street learnings, uh, the finance learnings into this space. And during a bull market, um, it looks like these experts very much like are the ones that make the most money. They're the ones talked about on the media, on CNBC, on Bloomberg. But this is a case where you are running essentially like a fractional reserve financialization model on top of crypto, even though users in the Web3 perspective own their own data, own their own coin with a click of a button can choose to leave any service, any exchange for another service. And this is kind of like the tail risk that is not like accounted for. Um, and in this case, there's no central bank that can bail you out because you can't print more BTCs. Or you can't print more uh, coins. And I think the space is coming to a reckoning between you know what crypto actually is and what people try to make it become with the whole financialization of it. So the big uh, the big boy in the room when it comes to, to crypto and, and the way that crypto has leaned into a bridge out of fiat is Tether. And my team wants to know, we're really curious as to what you, someone with your experience thinks about Tether. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, I don't know exactly what will happen with Tether. Obviously, they've serviced um uh, the books uh, fine until now, right? Uh, but I think like one of the reasons, one of the issues here is that again, this stable coins itself, whether it's Tether or it's UICC or anything, um, they're still trying to leverage this technology in the service of the existing world, right? Um, US dollars are not mentioned in the white paper. Uh, like, it, it, in effect, like because BTC could not scale or decided not to scale and kept it one megabyte, one of the only ways that you could make the number go up, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think if you're invested in a coin, you desire to go up, right? If you're invested in gold, you would desire to go up. Um, but because you can't do on-chain scaling, then you can only do it via exchanges, via structures like GBTC via things like um, utility, via stable coins and things like this. So I think the community is very different uh, pre-2013 and post-2013. So the bubble in 2013, there was no tether back then. Uh, there was just Bitcoin and people were like, how do we get merchants to accept Bitcoin? How do we get the whole world to use Bitcoin? How do we essentially trigger an upending of the entire currency system as we know it? Um, and when you now fast forward to 2017, 2021, and you enter this like multi-chain narrative, not on chain scaling, then you need to have a new narrative of, okay, how do we get Wall Street to buy into this? How do we get like normal uh, companies to get into this? How do we get central banks to buy into this? So then, you know, whether it's whatever these stable coins are, they, they should have a role, but I've always imagined it like stable coins as a total market cap of the entire space should be like maybe five, 10%. So if crypto is a trillion, stable coin should be like, I don't know, 50 billion, 100 billion, something like that. But if you look at the current like market cap of the top 10, it's like three of them are stable coins. I think Tether's at number four. Uh, or three, and USDC is at five or six, and then BUSD is at like seven or eight, or eight or nine, something like that. Like three in the top 10 are now stable coins. And that's because like none of these chains was able to build an economy of its own that was greater than the US dollar economy. And yet the stable coins can run in parallel on multiple chains at the same time. And now, it brings a level of transparency on the token side, right? Like you can see there's this much USDTs on chain, but you can't real time verify 
whether there is that much dollar sitting in a bank account. Um, and so like, whether it's good for its money or not, at the end of the day, it's not as native as like a, a proof of work, like token in the first place. So I think, I think we're sitting in this, like um, whether it was intentionally uh, sabotage the idea of on-chain scaling uh, by various like actors or whether it was just like a lack of imagination and people thought, of course, why wouldn't we want mainstream finance to get involved? Why would we not want people with a lot of money to buy a whole bunch of like coins and institutional investors? Either way, it's not so important. The idea is that like as interest rates have written this year, as people have realized that like crypto has fundamentally different aspects, uh, attributes than the existing financial system. Um, I think that what's happening with FTX is signaling that there's something that doesn't make sense. Um, uh, and stable coins can only serve a small role. It cannot have like the dramatic role it has right now. So we're curious about your opinion on Binance and ZZ. You know, I, I know that you know ZZ. I know that you're very familiar with Binance. So what are your thoughts on, on, on Binance in a post FTX world? Yeah, I think... Um, there's two parts, right? Like FTX clearly looks like looks like there was a lot of fraud going on of using customer funds and um, uh, over leveraging with customer funds. Um, it was there was not a lot of accountability or accounting. Certainly, there was no proof of reserves ever done at FTX. So that's one issue. Like without any certainty. I can't tell you whether that happens at Binance or not, right? But I think a bigger issue is that, like, so what if it doesn't happen at Binance? Like, so what if Binance is the most um, well-run company? The idea is that um, Bitcoin and its invention is fundamentally at odds with the idea of a well-run company, right? So, Please I explain that for people yeah, so, that are not familiar with, with your line of thinking. Sure. So like, imagine Blockbuster, right? Let's say like there's two Blockbusters. I don't know if at the time there was two. There was, I know in Canada, there was like Roger, Roger's video and then there's like Blockbuster or something like that. So one could be run like, um, like a scam, like completely stealing users' DVDs and like <laughs> whatever, and uh, overcharging customers' credit cards, right? And another one could be run completely well intentioned like a real blockbuster in the end both of them lose to youtube both of them lose to netflix right so right now in the absence of on-chain scaling the best experience you can have as a user is to use a centralized exchange um, and right now it appears that binance is the best run centralized exchange i think the initial reaction from the ftx uh, debacle is exchanges showing, hey, look, I have proof of reserves. Hey, that's not me. I'm running the exchange very fairly. Um, and if you think about it compared to um, a New York Stock Exchange, I would say Binance is more transparent in some ways, right? Like they, they actually can show you some level of reserves. I don't think New York Stock Exchange shows that, whatever. Now, uh, it works on Sundays, Saturdays, whatever, these benefits. But you never want to compare it to the past. Like DVDs work better than VCRs. Great. But that doesn't mean DVDs are, are going to survive. You know? So um, there's a scenario like fast forward five years from now, 10 years from now. It could be a, a month from now, right? Where they could have all the reserves. They could be um, a completely well-run company, but you would still prefer to no longer use the service because you rather use something on chain, right? Uh, and so Bitcoin um, was invented to kind of get rid of third parties, right? Uh, and live on chain. And for a period of time, uh, it appears that it's easier to run a centralized company than it is to run a decentralized network like Bitcoin. Um, and so we live in this era where you have the coins, but then most people use like a centralized service. Um, but eventually, and, and Binance could eventually still 
migrate to this. I, I'm not shortchanging their ability to do that, but they have kind of their feet in both camps. They have like a centralized exchange and they have a decentralized like DeFi um, proponent. And the first reaction coming out of this event is obviously to move from FTX to Binance or some other exchange that you think you can trust. But I think in the back of people's minds, they're like, well, why? I thought I could trust Sam too, two weeks ago. So like, it's almost like you can't, you can't like prove that you're different by doing a service that's similar. Like even if your service is different, even if your service is trying to do right by, by users, because I think the users are now going to upgrade to something completely on chain. Uh, and that puts you into a different paradigm of do you pick Ethereum? Do you pick um, uh, Binance chain? Or do you pick uh, BTC or BSV or whatever it is? I think that's the real conversation we want to have. So. Um, Binance, I would say, is like the best company of this type of um, companies. But I think the failure of FTX uh, kind of puts a doubt into the entire category. So what would an on-chain world look like? I know that's a loaded question, but you're someone that has left this company, quote unquote, world, right? You've worked at these big exchanges and people are asking, well, what is Jack Lou doing? You know? He, he, he was there at the beginning of USDT. He was there at the beginning of USDC. He was at Kraken. He was at OKX. He was at Circle. What the heck is he doing pursuing this idea of an on-chain world? How can we, uh, what would be the, the difference of an on-chain world, on-chain exchanges, on-chain economy? Yeah, like, I think there's a famous video of Steve Jobs saying that uh, your life makes sense like looking back, like the, the dots will connect looking back. They don't make sense looking forward. That's been the story of my life the whole way through. Like when I first entered Bitcoin, people were like, well, what the hell is that? What are you doing with that? Uh, when I first worked at exchanges across the world, sometimes in Silicon Valley, sometimes in, in, um, in Beijing, my uh, Wall Street friends were like, well, what are you doing? Like that's, this is pre like this is like BTC three four hundred dollars. Uh, this is like Ethereum one dollar. Um, so when I first kind of stepped into making things on chain, I, I look I I'm the son of like a doctor and a chemist. Okay, so while my um, medicine knowledge and science knowledge is near zero, I do have a logical mind when I look at look at these things from a physics and a, chem, a math perspective. And what I sort of believed from the very beginning is that once you have a chain that will scale on chain and scales continuously on chain, then um, you will no longer live in a multi-chain world. Right. Uh, that, you will yeah. live in a single chain world. So um, does that mean there won't be assets? No, there will still be lots of assets, whether fungible tokens or NFTs. But if one chain is scaling so much faster, so much better, then the the exchange itself can be built on top of Bitcoin. So like right now, when people think about um, on chain, all they think about is like withdrawing their coins from the exchange to a wallet that they own. Um, and I see even like tweets talking about use exchanges like their public toilets or something, get in, get out, right? Uh, don't stay, don't stay in it, right? But like, if you open up your imagination a little bit more and you have on-chain like scripting, on-chain like programmability, you can have the entire um, exchange, the entire order book built on-chain. And this has been demonstrated on Ethereum in some ways, um, but it doesn't scale. So people kind of still use centralized exchanges despite on-chain scaling. But if you have um, complete scaling, like in the case of Bitcoin SV, then it seems to me that like the entire world of finance or exchange can be done by the uh, programmability of Bitcoin itself. So there's a lot of other uh, protocols out there aiming to be that killer protocol that scales on chain. Everyone seems to have realized that the layered approach to scaling is bullshit. It's inefficient and it does not allow you to really enjoy the interoperability of a, of what a blockchain is to offer you. So there are other networks out there that are new, 
And some of them you I, I've I've noticed that you on Twitter once in a while mention them. And for example, Saito, Radiant, Aptos. What are your thoughts on these do uh, new networks? Yeah, my base case scenario is that um, some network attached to the original Genesis block, um, or at least let's let's put it this way, that shares the same SHA two fifty six mining algorithm is going to be the one that wins. Um, I'll give you an example. So right now, I think Bitcoin Cash is number 20 on CoinMarketCap, and BSV is number 50. So clearly, there's plenty of coins, several coins, that trade at a higher valuation to these two, okay? Um, but we all know this with FTX, this idea of a, a negative contagion. A negative contagion I call similar to COVID-19, as in it's a virus. It has ripple effects across the whole ecosystem, or in the case of COVID, it has an effect across everyone's health. But it's a negative contagion, as in it's something people don't want to suffer from, right? If you're an exchange, you don't want to suffer from the contagion of FTX. If you're a person, you don't want to catch so Or stupidity. I, I think that was stupidity, by the way, but I don't want to catch whatever, stupidity. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like, you know, whether you believe in masks or not, you're trying to not get it, right? Whether you think this is like perpetrated by the elites or this is a natural causing thing from a wet market the reality is you don't want to get you don't want to get sick right um but like if you think about the ftx story right whether you came across it on bbc news on a headline or you came out came across on a bloomberg i believe in the past week about 200 million people have in their head thought of the words ftx they might not know what it means, but it's been in enough, enough newspapers and whatever that there's about 200 million people that have thought about it. It's like inception, right? But there's only about a, a couple million people who actually have funds at FTX. So it's a contagion as in like, it's a new story that goes worldwide, but only a couple million people are directly, directly affected. And everyone else is kind of talking about it as a, a gossip or talking about it. But um, in Bitcoin, let's say I, I call Bitcoin the hyper Bitcoinization. The idea is a is one of the first ever ideas of positive contagion, as in if for some reason two hundred million people were to hear about Bitcoin and to get some, and it's like going up in price, right? Then all two hundred million people, not just two million people, all two hundred million want to get some. And because it's upending the entire like way that they do business, the entire way that they save money. So it's a it's a contagion that gets stronger, that makes everyone who catches the, the bug want to proselytize like the idea even stronger. That's a more powerful uh, network like scaling, like in terms of inhumans like choice than what we experienced in FTX. So by logic, if FTX could unravel in the space of 72 hours. And in 72 hours, you have essentially people go from not knowing about FTX to now completely questioning centralized exchanges. Then the, t the amount of time that it'll take for Bitcoin to take over uh, will be dramatically less than 72 hours. Now, I don't know when that time will start. It could start tonight. It could also start a thousand years from now. Um, but what's interesting is that if you run on the same SHA-256 algorithm, right, then just like when you hear FTX is in trouble, you'll log into your account and click on withdraw. If you're a miner that's mining a different chain, right, if you're mining BTC, if you're mining BCH, and let's say BSV is taking off, you will also log into your mine, mine pool configuration and you'll also press a button and start mining BSV. And it could, it could work the other way. You could be mining BSV and then click a button, go mine BTC. So what's happening is a positive contagion as in the bigger you grow, the more you just attract the hash rate of the infrastructure. So when you look at the feasibility of a BSV or some chain that runs on 256, you have to understand that when it starts popping, you have a positive contagion of the entire mining infrastructure that today is in the tens of billions of dollars 
that will all coalesce around your single chain. So if you are currently better than BCH or BSV and you're ranked number five or ranked number six, if you're Ethereum or something, you can always grow faster, sure, for now, but you don't have that kind of like turn the jets on moment because no matter how much you grow, you're not going to suck in the mining infrastructure from a BTC, from a BCH. And so I like to think that the potential winners here uh, in a base case scenario is I want to own SHA-256 chains. I'm open-minded to new people who want to build new chains that has like a new Genesis block that runs on SHA-256. Maybe that'll work. And then I want to hedge myself by owning some chains that are different consensus algorithms like a Saito, like a, like a Radiant. I'm not, this is not financial advice. I'm just looking at like, like that kind of paradigm. You want to hedge yourself for a on-chain world. Um, but I still think in my base case is, it's going to be a SHA-256 chain. And until I see another chain come out that has more scalability than BSV, regardless of what I think about Craig Wright or Calvin Air or any of these actors, right? I'm going to still bet on the chain that currently can scale the most, which is BSV. Just like even if you thought, you know, Sam and FTX as a result of Tom Brady sponsorship, as a result of having like Miami Heat sponsorship, all the top VCs, all the top minds on Wall Street, no matter how safe you thought that was, the evidence showed you that that's not what runs the world. Math runs the world. Logic runs the world. So if something so shiny, so perfect can come down to zero, I can make the argument that something that looks so bad from a traditional PR perspective, as long as the chain's running, as long as the block is producing, as long as it is fully scalable, you could wake up tomorrow and the thing can go hyper like acceleration. That's kind of like, I think of BSV as your CDS for the entire crypto ecosystem as your full hedge. I tell a lot of my friends working crypto, the best thing you could do is take 5% of your crypto net worth, buy BSV, and actually hope it goes to zero, and actually be really happy if it goes to zero. Because if it goes to zero, then all these current narratives of exchanges, multi-chain, uh, proof of stake, they can all thrive because you have the failure of this proof of work scalability system. But if this thing takes off, then it's a beast that you can't contain because it's running on proof of work. It's not running on human companies and things like that. It's got incentive design that's better than a corporation, better than proof of stake, better than a DAO. It's got true like red queen mechanics behind it. And then you could find your entire uh, job wiped out. You could find your company wiped out. You could find your chain wiped out, but at least your 5% ownership in this BSV thing covered that because it went up 20x, went up you know 200x. So that's kind of what I think is that like this thing that's been created, this BSV, I don't know for sure if it'll win or not, but I do know if I'm looking at the mechanics of it, it's a completely different species than anything else you see in crypto, anything else you see in the real world. Uh, if I could be sympathetic to the idea that we want to kill it, we don't want it to exist, we want to uninvent Bitcoin, I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, if, if, if you want to make that argument, if you want to tell me the world is better before the internet, the world is better before this invention, I'm sympathetic to that to that logic. You know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that, you know, you know we want to ride horses instead of drive cars and like have, have roads and highways. Like I'm sympathetic to that kind of thinking, but in the absence of you proving that you can get rid of this, uh, whether you think of it as a good thing or think of it as a monster, I think you, it'd be well served to have a little bit of it in case it catches on, as Satoshi would say. So are you pretty much saying that the only reason why uh, you have this stance is because SHA-256 is the mining algorithm that has been the most developed. That it, with turnkey, you can have all of the Bitcoin miners be running a SHA-256 coin that scales uh, not just in, 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 the, in the area of finance and money, but also in computational power. Is that, is that what you're saying? That we can just switch miners to whatever this other chain is, whether it be BSV or something else? Like, yeah. Whereas in a Radiant that uses like SHA-12 or Saito or Aptos that use like 
other algorithms, they're still very young as a network. Their their computer capacity is still very young, so they're just not going to be able to scale when hyper Bitcoinization happens. Because um, I, I like you also. I I like what you say that when so- hyper Bitcoinization happens, it's going to happen real fast. You know, it's yeah, there's twenty four hours. You so you think it's going to happen within twenty four hours, and yeah. so. That's wild to me um, because that's something that I want, right? Um, but it's uh, to think of it being in 24 hours, it's almost like it's wild to me because it would be that would be very reliable on 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 the classical attributes of Bitcoin, which would be you know just the the monetary applications of Bitcoin. But when we see like the computational attributes of Bitcoin, the ability you can like you know create smart contracts, applications, store data on chain if you want to. Um, the, the whole fact that you can be your own entrepreneur, you don't need Silicon Valley. That to me, I think is really where if this is going to happen, it's going to happen because some on-chain network tapped into that that um, into that wellspring of human innovation and everyone's just like, going for it and just making their dreams come true in the most efficient system possible, you know? So to, for me, that takes time, right? To, for someone to acquiesce, understand, and, and and become an entrepreneur within a network that allows you to create freely and scale, on, on, you know, infinitely. But I think that, that requires time for people to actually understand and, and use it. So it seems to me that your your perspective is one that relies on the monetary aspect of 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 what we know Bitcoin classically to be for that to blow up. Is am I is that is that what I'm yeah. getting? So to? yeah, so like people have been talking about uh, the potential for pandemic for 20, 30 years. Um, if you told anyone that a pandemic is coming in two thousand nineteen, they will laugh at you, right? But in the span of like a week in March 2020, you go from nobody caring, like the total mask wearing population on the planet was like cosmetic thinking, like um, uh, kind of um, thinking people in like mostly in Taiwan or like in in Japanese women or something. You went from like basically probably an installed base of mask wearers from of 2 million to what, 2 billion mask wearers within a week, right? And that's for a virus that's coming out of Wuhan that needs to be spread human to human, like physically. Like it doesn't just go from Wuhan to Alaska, like overnight, you need actual human carriers to spread the virus. And that's something like that can go viral in like a week. And then you look at something like well, FTX, At least the like, idea of it, right? The idea of yeah, it. Still, it, it, t- it takes a week. Right. But no one's trying to get it. Everyone's trying to avoid it, right? Um, no one profits from getting Do you know what I mean? As an individual, it's not like I make money from me getting In fact, I end up with more hospital bills. I end up with being sick, right? I don't want to get it, right? Um, but if something's taking off that is going to make the owner of the coin make more money, I want more of it. I want, as soon as I get a lot of it. I want other people to get it. This is a positive contagion. No human being has experienced that in their time on earth, right? Even the internet, it's like, cool, I'm on I'm on AOL. I want my friends to be on AOL, sure. But we're not going to make money from the fact that AOL is taking off. So this is like internet growth, um, but faster than even growth. So like even FTX, right? This is why it's so important to be prepared. Um, it, one of the reasons why the Wall Street types miscalculated the idea of uh, using customer funds or fractional reserve is they never understood that on a random tweet on a Sunday by some guy, that an entire run on the exchange could manifest itself. Like they should have understood that, but that was not part of the calculus. And so because information travels at the speed of light, you had basically withdrawals from FTX exchange in the order of five to $6 billion uh, 
over two days, over three days, right? And that took, and then that means you need to fundraise within one day, and no one's prepared to give money. Like if you think about the way Silicon Valley operates, it's almost like you need us, so we'll tell you come to Sand Hill Road, you know, come have a coffee, go work on your deck. But in crypto, things can move so fast, you almost need like emergency fundraising. That's why Sam went for CZ, right? Like CZ is probably the only one that can move that fast. You need someone from crypto to, to try and fundraise. Um, but at least like when you are faced with this negative contagion, which is I need to get my funds out of FTX, every single person that needs to do that has already used FTX. They have uh, done withdrawals before as a user. It's something they're familiar with. So if they had heard the news on Twitter and they have fast reflexes, they had a chance to go log into the FTS account and like try and withdraw the funds out, right? But when hyper Bitcoinization happens and you're and you don't already hold the coins in cold storage, right? Then you could be right every day of your life that this thing's a shit coin, this thing's trading lower, this thing's gone from number 20, number two, number 30, number 40, number 50. Um but that's like saying I'm right about housing this whole time in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, and then boom, subprime hits, and then boom, the banks are like in trouble. But here, there's an even bigger risk is that because the, the hyper Bitcoinization will happen in a 24 hour period, if you don't already have Bitcoins at the beginning of that 24 hours, every single minute, every single hour that you are late, to try and get Bitcoin during that 24 hour period, you might be buying Bitcoin at double the price of the previous hour, triple the price of the previous hour, 10X, 100X the price of the previous hour. And you are forced to do something that you've never done before in your life because you've never owned BSV. You've never known where to go buy BSV, whatever it's called, Bitcoin, right? You've never, never done this action. So, you, you, you're not going to catch like the, the, the move. Whereas on FTX, you've done withdrawals before you go there and withdraw, you, you might have a chance. So again, the best, the best case scenario is just have some Bitcoin now and then just let it go to zero if it goes to zero. And then life will continue the way we've known it. But if this super scenario happens, you have no time during that 24 hours to get some. Now that's fine, like you can get it later. Like if you divide the population, two billion people, 21 million coins, if everyone's happy with having a few hundred thousand Satoshis only, that's fine. I'm sure your life will be fine. But the way to make money in that scenario is to own the coins now uh, before anything happens. So does people, like I know you're friends with like ZZ and a lot of people that are big into the exchange world and into the crypto world, as you like to call it, the crypto world, right? Do they think you're crazy to be talking about this? You're someone that was like with them side by side, you know, creating these exchanges. Actually, you create you were part of creating exchanges that never failed. So in a sense, you have a better track record than SBF. Let's be honest. And Maybe, here you yeah. are talking about crazy BSV. And we said we weren't going to talk about it during this interview. But we hey, you brought it up, man. So I have to ask. Hey, you. It, it, it could you... be BCH. It could be BTC also. It could just any okay. shop 256 is possible. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it is possible. Um, But, you know, they would have to have that culture of scaling on chain because you can have the facility, you can have the, yeah. you, the, the technology. But if you don't have the culture, like Bitcoin Cash doesn't have the culture. Yeah, BTC, ask me what you... Ask me what you're going to ask me. I cut you yeah, off. Yeah, what what do these do these uh, peers of yours? You know, do they see you being? What do they think of you? You're one of them, and here you are, focusing on scaling on chain in BSV. Isn't that something that uh, you know they all would say? Well, hey, you guys already lost the hash war. Give up on your dream of scaling on chain. And why are you even wasting your time around fake Toshi? What's going on? Sorry to be so forward, but like I, I know everyone watching this is dying for me to ask you. Like, yeah. like we you know where are you in this? Because like you are someone you could be doing so many things right now, and sure. you're highly respected all over crypto. And here you are, you know, saying, you know what, guys, I see something here. I see that there's value in an on-chain world. 
Yeah. So my perspective all along, when I started building these exchanges, right, uh, is that I thought exchanges were similar to like AT and T or like broadband cable. It's kind of like a gateway to get you into Bitcoin, right. and then you will live live in this on chain world, right. Um, that's how I understood the Bitcoin white paper from the, the time I read it. Now, based on some circumstances of BTC not scaling, of having proof of stake, having a bunch of other chains, it looks like for a period of time that the exchange model uh, is the best and the exchanges have made the most money. I think they may continue to make the most money. Um, but as soon as Bitcoin did manage to scale, uh, you could say that I was wrong for the last four years. Certainly financially, I could be very, very wrong, not not uh, be more invested in the same exchanges I've built or my friends have built and, and whatever. But uh, not to say that like, like look at what happened to Sam, like the entire empire could go to zero in, in a week, right? And even if you have everyone's user assets one-to-one and you did not use user funds, like I said, the Blockbuster example, they had every DVD, okay? But as soon as people don't want DVDs anymore, you're going to zero. Like, or you're going to have to come to Bitcoin and build your business there. So to me, I just don't like to do things that like won't last forever. Um, and the way Bitcoin was invented, it made it clear to me, I think I've said this on a podcast like five, six years ago, that Bitcoin will be forever, the ledger is forever, the companies on top of it are like um, temporary. Um, and if progress is slow enough, that doesn't look like the case, but if progress is fast enough, you'll see sort of crazy competition between companies built on top of the technology and they will each like knock each other out. And maybe I'm a little bit lazy, maybe I'm a little bit like clever or whatever you wanna call it. So I, at some point, do not want to fight a battle that I can't win. Um, so I'd rather, you know, be on the chain and have the chain work with me. So I think, like, uh, what do people think about me? Uh, I don't know. I think some people will initially think I lost my mind or something. Like, he was good. He was useful when he... Just like, hey, look, Kanye, Kanye West is useful when he just wants to design sneakers for Adidas, when he just wants to put out some nice uh, records. But when he goes into his free mind, people want to get rid of him, right? Um, and, you know, maybe like if we can contain this technology to something that's just like a digital gold or just something that, you know, you use it and it's a multi-chain world, then maybe they'll, they'll, they'll like my tactics. But if you want to kind of really look deeper and understand this This is like a winner-take-all blockchain, right? Um, then people don't like it as much. But I think there's enough people that believe that I'm not crazy. Uh, they might just believe that what I'm saying won't happen in our lifetime. And quite frankly, I might sound very confident right now, but there was times in the last couple of years, as you saw crypto taking off, as you saw uh Bitcoin and things I work on kind of coming down, there were times that I was like, maybe I got it wrong timing. Maybe I'll be 85 years old. Maybe I'll be 100 years old before this thing happens, if ever. Um, but I think the events of what happened with interest rates at the Fed, with what happened with um, FTX, have certainly accelerated that timeline. If it was going to be 100 years before the 24-hour period, it's now 99 years at least maybe it's 50 years maybe it's 20 years so this makes me feel like i'm not crazy i've always been like about three to four years too early if you think about it like of uh when i was in this space versus when it becomes mainstream so we're right now exactly about three to four years um and i do think that when when people try to go on chain which is what they've been trying to do next people most yeah people that's think what they're doing yeah that's that what everyone wants try- right now yeah, they're gonna try and do it on Ethereum first. They're gonna try and do it on Solana first. They're gonna try and do it on Aptos first. And I think that they're gonna find out in the next one or two years that building on a proof of stake chain has similar risk profiles to trusting centralized exchanges. Because when your validators are set, when your validators uh, 
can be um, controlled by uh, nation states and such, then you have similar uh, negative possibilities to these chains. And I think that'll be the next lesson to be learned. And once you've learned enough lessons, there's nowhere to turn to except for uh, scalable Bitcoin. And I think my estimation is uh, at most we are 48 months away at most. Damn. But I would say there is a better chance that we are less than six months away than there is that we are more than 48 months away. To hyper Bitcoinization? Yeah. Damn, really? You're damn, you're making some bold claims here, Jack. I'm just doing probabilities. Like I would say, let's say there's like less than 10%, it's less than six months, but I'd say it's less than 10% is more than 48 months. So I, I think even less than that. So I think it's some somewhere in that range. Um Okay. So you worked at OKX and Kraken, and a lot of the people watching this right now are probably curious as to, you know, these are two exchanges that hold Monero. And very few exchanges in the world actually serve the Monero community, the privacy coin community. Um, There's a lot of speculation within these privacy coin communities that there's short selling of Monero happening in the exchanges. What are your thoughts of this? I mean, this? I haven't worked on a day-to-day -day basis for like five years. Uh, actually, I didn't even realize as of the question that these exchanges still listed Monero. Um, I think the real question here for any coin, whether privacy or not, is do you have a way to grow uh, absent decentralized exchanges? Uh, um, because if you still rely on exchanges, then they could fail, like in the case of FTX. They could delist it because of regulatory pressure against privacy coins. Um, so the question I would have for the Monero community is, can you get uh, growth without centralized exchanges? Um, you know, like people talk about like silver is artificially shorted by the uh, commodity exchanges. They're talking about like fake silver, paper silver. Well, sure, you might be right, but can you grow the silver market without them? And in the case of silver, I'd say mostly no, because it's not fungible. It's not port. It's not portable uh, without like sort of some exchange, right? You have to move the physical silver. So in the case, it, it could still have its attributes for silverware. It could still have its attributes for um, uh, like uh, jewelry and different kind of use cases uh, in materials, but it can't be used as money uh, as conveniently without centralized exchanges. So question is like can you have your privacy coin function uh without decentralized exchange I, I you're the expert on that i mean there are the there are decentralized exchanges right that people are are working on and, and so what advice would you give to privacy coin communities like uh like pirate chain or Dero that are younger communities that want to be listed on exchanges how can they go about doing that I don't know. I just think that like that game has been played for like what eight years now, five years now of like trying to get things listed on exchanges, paying a listing fee, and things like this. Um, I think that game is kind of like up at this point. Like especially with high interest rates, it's not clear to me that like the center of the networks are going to be with these exchanges. I mean, I think there'll always be. A, 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 when people want to say this, people think I think the exchanges are going to go to zero. I don't, right? I think the exchanges will still be around, but I think the pie is going to grow so big that, like, um, relatively speaking, there's like bigger growth areas. So I, I personally believe that you can have privacy built within a chain that is not private from the ground up. Now, that is a take that a lot of people don't agree with. They want everything to be private by default, right? Yes. Uh, um, yeah. So again, I think like the, the even in that scenario, I think a chain that starts with SHA-256 has, still has a better chance than the chains that do not because you still, if you're right about privacy, that everyone wants privacy, you have a chance to get Bitcoin miners to mine that um, uh, and have that cascading effect. I think we're in this domino effect game and you want to be positioned so that you can trigger all of the infrastructure to coalesce around um, 
your chain. This is a very much a tail risk kind of uh, proposition. But I do think that in a world where there's 8 billion people and anyone can at any time start coding on any of these blockchains, you want to be positioned for tail risk. Have you heard of Dero, D-E-R-O? It's the privacy no. Ethereum. Yeah, so out okay. of all of the all of the networks like Saito, Aptos, Radiant that are trying to compete in this space, Dero is like the one that comes from the privacy coin community that aims to scale on chain, like you said, privacy from the bottom up. Nice. Would you? So that's the thing. Like it would be nice. It would be nice to see exchanges on Dero, um, but again. I guess the approach that they could also take is what you call the old game of, you know, calling the exchanges and asking them to list them and pay the exchange, whatever listing fee and so forth. So, Jack, where where are we going post this FTX world? Because you mentioned DCG, Digital Currency Group. What's happening there? What's going on? This is news that's just breaking right now. You know, it's like. I, to be okay, to be honest, for me, I'm, I see these guys all as banksters. I don't care for them. I don't consider them crypto. I agree with you a thousand percent that we should scale on chain so that we don't have to deal with this type of BS. If it's up to me, the the faster we pull all the band aids, the better. So I don't care if DCG and it's all of its companies were to go down tomorrow. I'd actually would welcome that. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, the thing is like. If they went down right now, all that would happen is someone else would just build the next DCG. Um, because you can only get people to stop renting DVDs when you offer something better, like Netflix or YouTube. So hoping Blockbuster going down without having an alternative in place would just be like, okay, cool, well, Blockbuster went down. Let me build a new Blockbuster. You see what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I understand like versus the potential of on-chain economy, you might not need a DCG. But uh, you need that to be built. And as long as there is not a scalable blockchain that everyone's building on, then I would say that the people are still going to prefer uh, the DCG kind of model. Um, so if you think about where the demand for these products come from, the GBTC, number one is it's not easier to store your BTCs yourself than to click a button in your Roth account to just buy the GBTCs like as a one-to-one -one backed with the BTC certificate. Um, and number two, a lot of people still have a whole bunch of uh, money in their stock market accounts with beneficial tax treatments. So because of that arbitrage, there's a demand for this GBTC product. But again, I would say like people didn't just move to Netflix because Netflix was better than um, Blockbuster, but because the internet as a whole was helpful to defeat Blockbuster because now you're relying on the internet to do AOL, to do lots of other activities, might as well watch, watch your movies and your videos there too. So it's more about the entire ecosystem of what will be built on top of Bitcoin that will compel people to bypass these kind of traditional financial instruments. And the risk with this stuff is that when you have someone else custody your Bitcoin, right? It's the same, it's a reverse risk of Tether, right? In Tether is the case of uh, you're you're trusting them to hold on to your dollars while you have the USDT on chain in your wallet. Here, it's uh, you're trusting DCG to hold on to the Bitcoins while you hold shares of GBTC that's supposed to be one-to-one -one backed by Bitcoins. Whenever that happens, even though it's irrational to like touch the reserves, as is clear in a bull market, and there's so much demand for yield, so much demand to like make more money. If you think about the agency problem in, in humanity, right? Let's say I'm an employee of one of these companies. I only want to work there for two years. What am I trying to maximize for? Obviously, I'm trying to maximize my pay, my bonus, and that's it. I don't really care if this thing goes bankrupt five years from now, 10 years from now. Right. Like if you think about you're the subprime mortgage uh, lender, those those kind of brokers that were trying to get people to get in, into ninja loans or whatever you, you saw from the big short. It's like, well, I want to maximize my payday this year. I could not care less if in two years this whole thing falls down. So in that scenario, even though you should just hold the coins one to one or in FTX scenario, you should just never touch customer funds. 
If you're like, hey, that will allow me to party harder. That will allow me to have a bigger bonus. That will allow me to fly private jets. If you're not allowed to do that, then, then since you do have access to all the people users' funds, why not come up with safe ways to lend out these coins? So we don't know yet what will happen with ECG. This is all conjecture. I, I don't know if they've touched the coins. But anytime that you are not like... The whole invention of Bitcoin or the blockchain is that you as a user can have a direct account with the blockchain itself. You don't need right. to have an account with somebody else and then they have an account with the blockchain. But in this whole like idea of that's too hard, uh, nobody wants that. Everyone wants to know something that they're familiar with, uh, You know, watch Super Bowl ads and have a form factor that they're familiar with. That's one thing. It's, it's nice to try and make a nice UI for the mainstream. But when the UI comes at the cost fundamentally of changing the ownership from the user to now the like provider, the service provider, you now pro give a lot of agency problems to the people that you trust in this company because they now can lend the coins out and do all kinds of stuff. And I think that um, it was a case of if you're a top employee, right? And you're debating between two offers. Like, do I want to work at this company for a million dollars a year? Or do I want to work at this company for $50,000 a year? The best talent is going to choose a million, right? But where does a million comes from, right? Also with yield, if I can put my money here for 8% interest versus over here for 2%, I'm going to choose 8%. Well, in the future, people that might, might not choose it this way. But for a period of time, because you are sold that crypto, all it is is just like, a technology uh, is it, not anything different than traditional banking. Then right. people people are like, oh, I buy gold ETFs, I buy silver ETFs. Why not buy a Bitcoin ETF, right? But when right. you buy a when you buy a gold ETF, the the providers um, don't have so much power as they do when they own the private keys to your bitcoins, right? So you've kind of taken away the power from the individual, and you handed a nuclear bomb level power to these service providers and we're caught in this like fake debate between well are they fully backed and are they not fully backed the, the idea is that like as long as the power is in these people not in your own hands it's always going to end up somewhat in bad actors hands because the the, the the temptation is too large the incentives are the agency problem is too big so are you proposing on-chain exchanges i just saying that that will naturally happen um, because these off-chain exchanges, right? Like when you are forced to compare between, let's say a Binance versus an OKX versus a Kraken, you're you're comparing almost like between a Blockbuster and a different DVD store. They all still right. require you to walk there and rent the DVD and return it and whatever. Like these exchanges still all require like KYC, right? your first experience is still like, let me get an account set up. Let me wait, let me wait like a, a day to get my account open. Some exchanges are slow, maybe it takes a week, right? Let me queue up a withdrawal, these kind of things. Right. Um, I'm, it's not about whether I propose on-chain exchanges or not. Uh, it's like, I don't propose YouTube versus cable television. I'm just saying that like someone will be able to build a better um, video platform on the internet than they can on like the cable television system. Right. I, I just feel like so, so, so someone, so, someone, someone's going to, yeah, someone's okay. going to build something on chain and it could be, it could be the founders of OKX. It could be the, it could be CZ. I'm not talking about, I, I don't hate the player, right? I'm talking about the game. Um, it very, might, very well might be these people because they have, incredible business acumen or whatever. I'm just saying that on chain, on a scalable chain, will create a way better product than a centralized world. Right on, and right that's, on. That's just, so, that's just a time. We're just waiting for time for this to happen. So, so to clarify, a lot of people, when they hear about alternatives to KYC ML exchanges, they're thinking about DEXs, decentralized exchanges. A decentralized exchange could be on chain, but decentralized exchanges don't necessarily have to be on chain. That's something that, that people should keep in mind as well. Now, what, what Jack here is vouching for is an on-chain exchange that 
yes, by its nature, will by default be decentralized. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be, but at least we'll have that transparency of everyone using the same accounting book of the blockchain itself, correct? Yep. Okay. Now, the question that people have is that right away they'll jump to, well, you're vouching for a transparency protocol like Bitcoin, any of the Bitcoin, uh, like the Bitcoin protocol in general. It's transparent. It's not private by default. There's a lot of people will say, there's no way I'll put my money in a place that does KYC, is on a transparent blockchain. And yeah, it's just, I'm opening myself up to a lot of surveillance. What are your thoughts on that? No, I'm saying that like, because the exchange will live on chain, I don't know how much KYC will be enforceable. What do you mean by um, that? Because the actual order book will be programmed into Bitcoin itself. Um, mm -hmm. And then there could be a thousand different interfaces to the same exchange. So right now, like Uniswap has a different liquidity pool than SushiSwap or any other thing. There's a world where you can have a shared liquidity uh, for the entire, like the, the exchange is Bitcoin itself. I see. Yeah, that makes and sense. Then, and then every interface is a UI on top of it. Um, and I think what people consider to be an exchange will be dramatically different. See, right now, your your like table, like when you have a like a garage sale and you try to sell your table, you sell your couch, you are running an exchange for one day on a Saturday morning. You're running an exchange of here's my stuff, come buy my yard sale and buy it, right? Right. Um, but because it's very inefficient to do it this way, we choose to have like New York Stock Exchange or Binance to exchange like financial assets, right? So there's these things called iPhones that we use, and then there's things called Apple shares that we like trade around, okay? Um, but when you can tokenize every single asset in the digital world and the physical world, and they can be represented as NFTs, then the exchangeability is built into the goods or service itself. So what will naturally happen is you'll see a shrinkage of the financial sector because every single thing in the real world or the digital world will already come with finance built in. So how much do I want to trade something that's purely, like I want to bet on the Australian economy. I don't necessarily want to bet on the Australian dollar, you see? But right, right now, because I can't actually trade whatever things are being created in Australia, I have to like trade like, shares of companies in Australia, currencies of the government of Australia. You have to trade these other things. And I'm just telling you, because of technology now, it doesn't just allow like you to go from a share certificate to like a token. This is step one, the ICO era and whatever. That, I, that's cute, right? That's cute. But if like literally this bottle right here can be tradable, then everything's tradable. Like, why am I still trading shares? That's the bigger story. Like, when that happens, then it's not about, should I still do KYC for my million dollar account? The question is, should I need to do KYC to buy a bottle of water? Mm. Right? Taylor Swift's concert tickets were went very viral last week. And they're trading on Ticketmaster and stuff. Should you need to do KYC to buy a ticket to a concert? Right. So everything else becomes tradable. So then we don't really care about trading financial assets because the everything else market is like a thousand times bigger or 10,000 times bigger. And it's so unique. It's so random. It's so produced by everyday people. So peer to peer. How do you enforce KYC? Would the people want to do KYC? Is there still a case for KYC? Like maybe there is. I'm not making any statements about that, but I'm just saying like, the nature of exchange is going to be a form factor that people just cannot imagine. Uh, and the exchangeability will come built into every good and service that you will use in the economy, digital or physical. How do we get there? I've kept saying that, like, don't ask me. I'm not the CEO of some company. I'm telling you as an observer of what was invented in 2008 that 
people are naturally going to build it. People are naturally going to build it because there's 8 billion people. I mean, look at the microcosm. Look at Twitter coming in under Elon Musk leadership, 75% of people cut. You have very few employees, yet the product seems to be getting better. That should be telling you that like the amount of human labor you need to build something is very little. The right. amount of financial capital you need to build something is very little. Right. Um, so when Bitcoin's first invented and it's 2009 and it has never had even a pizza sell for Bitcoins, let alone an exchange. If you ask people who's going to build, how do we get there? The, the answer is you don't need the answer to this. Someone named Eric Voorhees will come in and build Satoshi Dice. Someone named Mark Carpellis will make Mount Gox. And if Mount Gox is terrible, someone named Brian Armstrong will build Coinbase. These are not the same actor. I might, I might sound like I know what I'm talking about, about Bitcoin, but you don't have to look at me to, to know if, if I'm going to be the one that builds it. It will be actually counter to the idea of Bitcoin there, like I, there is about the same amount of chance that it'll be me that builds this as there is of me winning the Powerball lottery. And I will be very humbled if you gave me a 1,000 times chance of that being me versus me winning the lottery. So let's say I have a 1,000 times better chance to win the lottery than anyone else. That's still a very, 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 very small chance that it'll be me. That is why this economy will be so dynamic. That is why hyper Bitcoinization could be at any time. Because by not owning Bitcoin, you are essentially short an unlimited upside convexity call option on human potential. And you could be right for as long as you want. But the moment one person figures this out, it could be a 10-year-old right now. It could be a 20-year-old. It could be a 50-year-old, right? Like on the internet, right? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg appears out of nowhere and starts co coding Facebook. Great. You haven't missed anything because he's only going to accrue value to Facebook, the company, shares. You still have time to call him up. Hey, can I invest in you? Can I give you an angel check like Peter Thiel? But because this is like the internet with a money on top of it, right? The value that will be accrued will be to Bitcoin holders. So the opportunity to invest in that Facebook is already here before Facebook exists. The, before the app exists, before whatever triggers hyper exists, you can already buy Bitcoin. You don't have to wait for Mt. Gox to appear for you to believe, oh, I should buy BTC. You could just buy as soon as the white paper comes out. And so I don't care that empirically right now, it looks like BSV is not on as many exchanges. It looks like... Everyone hates it. It looks like the leader of it is a pedophile or potentially a, a, a potentially a pedophile. Like it doesn't matter, right? Like, because we're not reliant on any of these actors. The network's not reliant on these actors to build something. Just like the internet is not reliant on Sears or Blockbuster or whatever to build on top of it, a random entrepreneur can come in, Jack Dorsey, to build Twitter. A random entrepreneur can come in to build Facebook. Except here, the value does not accrue to their companies or their shares. Some of it might. But the great majority of the value accrues to the base currency of the chain. So the asymmetric bet here is that does the chain scale? Is the chain producing blocks every 10 minutes? If the answer is yes, buy a bit. And then we'll see who builds on it. And, I, I, and just by personal experience, as someone who's not an engineer, who's not a coder, the fact that I can kind of self-fund a couple hobby projects to prove that this thing actually works the way that I thought it would, the fact that the last three years, while the coin has been going down in price by almost 10x, um, the fact that the minor fees have actually dropped, right? You would think that Ethereum, by going from $0 to $4,000, having all that wealth creation would incentivize somebody running these validators or these nodes or these mining miner, miners to make the scalability bigger, to have cheaper transaction costs. But it never happened, despite all the wealth creation, despite so many people. Because it can't happen. It can't happen on Ethereum. It won't, no it won't ever happen. No, it meanwhile, just can't. It can't happen. Right. Like, physically, meanwhile, B it can't happen. It can't. Yeah, but meanwhile, yeah. BSV, despite user droppage, despite price drop, you have miners that have lowered their fees on the network 
both in Satoshi terms by a factor of like 20, 30, 50 times, and in like dollar terms by a factor of like 300 times, okay, or, or 100 times plus. The fact that that is happening means not only is this a theoretical idea from a white paper, this is a practicality that's happening right now on the network. It's just that the network is not using. So like if, if you could own internet coins, right? And you knew the internet could do video, you should not need to see YouTube be taking off first before you want to buy some of those coins, right? So like I said, like the, until the network goes to zero and the chain stops like producing blocks, you still have, if you want to call a lottery ticket, you want to call it whatever, you have something that could be untapped potential on a mathematical level. I could also tell you this bottle of water could go to a trillion dollars, but that would just be more speculative. With Bitcoin, because there's no drag on the network, none of the coins ever goes to pre previous holders or previous miners. This network is as new today, <clears throat> despite being $30, um, is as new today as it was the very first block in 2009. So you're always betting against a fresh blockchain every 10 minutes. And I don't care how many times you are right on that bet, the very first block that you're wrong on that bet, good luck trying to get some of these Bitcoins because it's going to happen within a 24 hour time period. Okay, but you know, we didn't want to talk about BSV. You keep bringing up BSV, Jack, not me. Okay. So look, um, your perspective on scaling on chain is actually very different from the unmentionables, right? Within BSV, right? Craig, Craig right? right? <clears throat> Calvin Air and all of their new billionaire buddies that are coming, right? Like the Ager guy. Your your perspective, you're actually kind of very much disliked by those guys because you, you have a perspective that is like, that understands Bitcoin's incentives within themselves. And you understand that Bitcoin is like the company, whereas these guys are bringing in their boomer mindset to push this corporate world of patents and bullshit and legal bullying where a guy like you is like, you don't need that. When hyper Bitcoinization happens, you're not even going to need to push anything like that. It's just it, the market drivers will be enough of an incentive to people for people to join the network if everything you say is right. So where, how do you how do you fare being at odds with arguably, you know, the you know, guys that are really influential within that space? Yeah, so I know this is being recorded. A lot of my talks have been recorded over the past few years. Um, I don't care if I'm odds with people today. I care that I'm in congruence with people in a post-Bitcoin world. Because after that 24-hour period, I'm pretty confident that nothing I've said so far will be obsolete in a post-Bitcoin world. But all of their work will be immediately obsolete exactly. in a post-Bitcoin world. Yeah, because it's like they're thinking about this old world of corporations and patents when we have Bitcoin. Bitcoin, I think you said it. Uh, you said it once, right? That triple entry accounting got rid of the corporation. Bitcoin as triple entry accounting got rid of dual entry accounting. That And dual entry accounting is is the premise of the corporate structure to begin with. So when you have Bitcoin, the corporate structure is obsolete. So I, I agree with you 100%. And uh, yeah, yeah, people their, think their that, patents like, are going to be obsolete. Yeah, They think I'm anarchist. They think I'm anti-government. My point, as I said earlier in the show, is if you could show me a way to completely destroy Bitcoin, I'm sympathetic to that view. Like I'm saying that I just observe from a physics, math, and energy perspective that someone invented this and the cat's out of the bag. And I rather accept the reality than pretend that this thing doesn't, doesn't work or this thing doesn't exist. Um, so I my views on how to grow Bitcoin and what will happen have nothing to do with my political views, have nothing to do with whether I'm an anarchist or not, have nothing to do with whether I would like to see corporations fail or not, right? Like, there's just like a better corporation that's been in, invent, invented. Today's corporation needs to have a board meeting every three months to like do a financials every three months, have a CFO go talk on an earnings call. Bitcoin works every 10 minutes. You Today, you need to 
think about who am I going to hire as CEO? How do we make decisions in the company? Bitcoin has a new CEO every 10 minutes. In fact, this is what's interesting. As of this moment, for the listener listening to the show, it is not a 0% chance. It is a far higher than 0% chance that every single entity that has ever mined Bitcoin since 2009 until today, it is not a 0% chance that all of them have already mined the last block that they will ever mine. What do you because mean? Ten, what do you mean? Because ten, because 10 minutes from now, a new miner could show up and render every prior miner obsolete. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's how competition is wild. Anyone can compete. So so you could have a trillion dollars of infrastructure, whatever it is. You could you could be thinking you're running a, a badass mining company. It is not a zero percent chance that you've already mined your very last block. That's in the past. That you will never, as of this moment, ever mine another block. That is an efficiency of a corporation that is not dependent on its prior founders, on its prior like employees. That is an efficiency that nothing in the world today can can match. Like I, I get that you want to have term limits, you want to have a, every four years, you want to have an election. This is a ruthless election every 10 minutes that is possible that everyone up until now has been extinct. And that's not a one-time phenomenon. What I just said holds true for as long as Bitcoin is alive. At every single block, there's a non-zero chance that every prior actor has already mined its last block. Wow. So, you know, we have Bitcoin in its first use case, its first application, which is money. Then we have Bitcoin as Bitcoin as a smart contract protocol that guys like you have been crazy enough to try out and prove to the world that, hey, what Satoshi gave us also allows us to scale, not just on chain, but to do smart contracts on chain, store data on chain. Now we're talking about coordinating and communicating using Bitcoin incentives on chain and Bitcoin as the corporation that we all work for on chain. You are so many levels away from what the normal person in crypto thinks of when they think of crypto, of Bitcoin. They're still thinking in Bitcoin as money. And any other use case of it is dumb. And there's so many, so much propaganda about how, well, that's, you know, a, you know, adding data on chain is spamming the blockchain. Smart contact protocol. Well, that's what Ethereum was built for. Um, there's okay. so many, there's such a big propaganda um, machine against everything that you're saying that just like they, they, that they work very, very hard to keep people from even considering these ideas. Because really what happened was that people were kept from even, they were kept from even considering these as a possibility within the Bitcoin protocol. And just like you said that there's a contagion of ideas that people are were led to wear masks and act crazy, you're saying that a light bulb can switch and people will realize all of these other applications of what Satoshi gave us that despite being the first, in spite of it being the first technology, it's still the best in all of crypto. And you're saying that this is going to happen within 24 hours, that we're going to have hyper Bitcoinization. And it's a lot, it's it's a it, it's probably sooner than we expected. Dude, you're I'm here, I'm listening to you, and I agree with you. And, and I've put myself at odds even with a lot of my followers and my teams because I'm a big blocker and I have ha always had this perspective that you have. It's like I, I jive with you because you've left everything and you focus on this. I've also put my reputation on the line because this is the Bitcoin I fell in love with. But to hear you say that, man, this is going to be is, this is going to happen faster than we think, dude. Even to me, that sounds crazy, Jack. No, no, it, it might not sound not might not happen for a thousand years. Okay, but it'll happen between one thousand years and one thousand years and one day. I'm saying that S curve that people talk about, this S curve, right? of technology adoption, that middle part of the S-curve is one day. Oh, shit. So it, that's what it, I'm saying. It could happen any time within a thousand years is what you're saying. But when it happens... No, I, I, okay, look, I'm saying it could okay. never happen. <clears throat> okay. It could never happen. 
But from the time it happens, it takes about one day. Okay, let's say BSV doesn't exist. Bitcoin, the big block version of Bitcoin is dead. It's not going to happen on SHA-256. So what solution does humanity have when dealing with providing the world a, a, a something that um, satiates the need of having fair exchange that scales on chain so that we don't have to deal with FTX and that type of bullshit? What would we have to wait for? Would we have to wait for another protocol like Radiant, Apto, Saito that um, aims to scale on chain for it to grow enough to contain the world? Or what's up? What's what, what what's the answer to that? Um number one, I thought of things like Bitcoin before I ever heard about Bitcoin. And now that Bitcoin exists and Shot to V6 has been working every block since 2009. Uh, I'm grateful that it still works. So I like to think that uh, it'll work. If it does, doesn't work, the last, thing, the last thing I'm thinking about is how to make something else that works. Like to think that like this thing doesn't work, but you're going to think of something else is like, that's even rarer of a possibility uh, than what is already working just getting market adoption. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on Radiant then? So Radiant is BSV without the BS. They started all over again. It's not SHA-256, SHA <clears throat> it's SHA-512. So they're mining in their computers. They started with a brand new Genesis block. What are So do you think that's a trite no. endeavor? or, or No, no, like Radiant? I said, like depending on how you think about it, right? Like there's plenty of coins that have gone up more than BSV the last like several years. Radiant might not be an exception, right? There are like random things in the world that have gone up more than BSV. In fact, most everything has gone up more than BSV, right? Or BCH or BTC for that matter. I think the NASDAQ has gotten done better than BTC last five years, right? I'm just saying that like, it doesn't matter how good any of these chains uh, go until they supersede SHA-256 in terms of total infrastructure the tail risk of one of the shock to six coins going supernova within a 24 hour period will still exist. Like every single day, if I did a podcast with you about FTX is a scam and you should withdraw your funds, it will be irrelevant. Okay. And, it, and if they didn't have the issue they had last week, they could have lasted another three years, could have lasted another seven years, could have lasted another 10 years. But in a twenty, in a seventy-two hour period, a million people try to log into their account and withdraw their funds. Wow. A million people. Okay. I'm saying that when the incentives work the other way around, and you have positive contagion, not negative contagion. Uh, negative contagion is something that everyone else is trying to avoid. Positive contagion is something that everyone else wants to join in. Okay, that will lead to a hundred million people in a twenty-four hour period trying to get bitcoins. I'm not saying I'll be the one to trigger it. I'm not saying that it'll be triggered next week. I'm just saying that the S curve will look something like one day. And I agree with you. It has right now. It has to happen on a SHA two fifty six version of Bitcoin. It has, and like you said, because it is the only network of computers the miners that are capable of sustaining such uh well are able are capable of sustaining hyper bitcoinization heck it could happen on btc right if yeah, it could happen on any, any two shot tv6 coin yeah. if if btc were to finally open up its floodgates of innovation if they were to finally scale um ha aim for a fixed protocol heck even if they don't do it on the main chain if they were to just allow paul storks to implement side chains so that people that are creative can do like copy paste BSV as a BTC side chain. Sure. Dude, that would be it. Like th that would be fucking amazing. So, um, so it, it could happen and it, and it has to happen. Um, yeah, you're right. It could happen, but that's the thing. The issue is in BTC and in, in BTC and in Bitcoin cash, that culture of scaling on chain of experimenting with it, all of these aspects of Bitcoin, that you have been talking about, 
that culture doesn't exist. They just want to use Bitcoin yeah, as gold and, and or I think, cash. I think it'll it'll exist after uh, it already happened. But again, you have 24 hours to change cultures. I don't think you can get it done. I don't think in the middle of 24 hours, you can go scale Bitcoin, BTC, and try and surpass the network effects of a 24-hour seismic level of adoption. So the best way to try and make it happen on a different chain and not BSV is to go copy BSV right now. Except right now, every evidence points to that the BSV method is terrible. And BSV is the worst performing asset in the face of the earth. Right. So you're not going to get consensus to do that. But the moment you want to get consensus, it'll have already happened. Okay, so... Like I said, yeah. you have 24 hours. Right. Like, if you want to save FTX, you have 24 hours to come in with $10 billion. Otherwise, it's filing for bankruptcy. People cannot react at that kind of speed. Right on. But but then again, you know, we're talking about the cryptocurrency has the whole, the, the worst propaganda, the worst marketing, BS. No, but does, no, hold on, hold on. Okay, but FTX had the best marketing, had the best yeah. propaganda. It was on every single television channel. Did that help them? No, of course not. They're not, right? Yeah, and, and that's had, something that I've been saying. Marketing so, can so change it on matter. a dime. So, right. so it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Do you think if they were on Bloomberg TV more often that that would be that would have been better for FTX? Nothing would have different would have happened. Right, correct. So because the like fundamentals I said, were wrong, yes. Like I said, if we don't like BSV, let's go kill it. Go kill it. Like I'm sympathetic to the view that you don't want this around. Fine. But as long as this thing's producing blocks, I don't want to be short uh human potential. That's all. It has, I have no, I, I'm saying my opinions on this matter is completely irrelevant. I'm looking at this from a complete set of logical, um, science based perspective. It's not, I have a bag of this. I hope it pumps. It has nothing to do with that. I can, I can freely choose to have a bag of whatever I want. Right. Um, it is all about tail risk. People do not know how to price tail risk. Right. And the reality is like a lot of those things that you're talking about, mainstream media, whatever, they don't operate in a 24 hour period. Where do people get their news about FTX? They got it from Twitter. Like right. th things will happen so quickly across the world that it's a phenomenon that will end faster than you thought it began. And actually the moment this is, you know, human, human beings are very adaptive creatures. Okay. The funny thing is, when you, Raphael, after the 24-hour period, try to convince people that you're a visionary, that you saw this coming, they will laugh at you because right. they were like, I, all, I they're like, obviously, obviously this was going to win. I would have seen it coming as well. They were just like, I was just busy working at a bakery. I was busy working at a law firm. I didn't hear about this. Right. But obviously, I would have known that this was going to win too because people don't want to always like you think about ftx right the day before ftx fails everyone's like i love ftx it'll never fail the day after ftx fails everyone's like i saw it coming i knew it was mm -hmm. going to fail see this is how people behave um and that's natural so like this is a phenomenon that before it happens no one's gonna believe it can happen and after it happens no one will be there to give me credit they'll be like of course of course it was going to happen that's how human beings like think. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, I mean, I know I know people that are closeted supporters of of big block Bitcoin scaling, and I mean, do you know any like notable names that are like they just keep to themselves, but they know that this is a pop, this is a possibility, and they may be or may not be hedging a bet in this direction. Um. I mean, right now it takes like 500 bucks to buy 10 of these. Right. So I'm sure plenty of people put 500 bucks down as a tail hedge. Right. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's definitely uh, a proposition that 
I mean, we talk about privacy coins at the Crypto Vigilante, but this is a proposition that is the most controversial. And it's the one that has uh, lived through two civil wars in Bitcoin history. And it's almost like it's 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 a proposition in all of crypto, Bitcoin's original design that's been kicked the most. And I want to ask you some questions about regulation since we're on the topic. I SBF, got five to ten minutes oh, left before I got to run. But yeah, go ahead. Okay, so <laughs> ten yeah, this is it. Yeah, this is the last, the last question. All right. It seems like creeps tend to be the ones that want regulation. And we see, you know, the, the case, classical case with SBF wanting regulation. And people are listening to you talk about all of this. And we see characters within... BT, BSV wanting regulation. So what are your thoughts on this? Because it's like anyone that pushes for regulation, you know, given the track record of SBF, I don't know, maybe those people don't seem to be the most trustworthy. Yeah, I think um, I have no opinion either way on regulation. I think that uh, what will become of this technology is clearly not in the minds of most people. So most people don't really know what they're, what they're going to regulate. Like um, if you don't have an imaginative mind and you only see this as a financial product and that you custody and you operate like a centralized exchange, I do think you should be regulated. I think that maybe you want to regulate the on-chain stuff too. But we don't know what's going to be built on chain. So there, it's very hard to regulate something that you don't understand. And quite frankly, you and I don't understand what's going to be built on this blockchain, right? Right. The time to regulate Bitcoin was before Bitcoin was invented. If you could somehow make no one able to come up with something called Bitcoin, that's your most efficient type of regulation. Once right. the white paper is out, once the chain is out, you can see that like even when you tell people BTC is Bitcoin, there are some crazy people who want to do BCH. Even when you try to cut it off at BCH, there's some crazy people who want to do BSV. Um, I am not important to this conversation at all. Like I could have no companies on this network. I could have no ownership of BSV. And the exact same possibilities remain. So I think that like, if you are in a business model of the past that is regulatable, um, then yeah, you can be in that conversation of should I be regulated, should I not be regulated? Sure, have that conversation. But most of what will happen on this uh, blockchain is things that have not been imaginable uh, in anyone's mind. And the reason why I think it'll happen within 24 hours is it'll be built, something will be built on chain that is hyper open. So it can leverage every single aspect of the Bitcoin network. It's not gonna be custodial. It's not gonna be like um, something to address the current mainstream. Uh, it's gonna be something that we've never seen before that fully uses the entire capabilities of the Bitcoin blockchain. Those are the things that will actually go viral, not something that like you already did. So like, we have some ideas of what that might be. Please right? explain. What are those ideas? It'll be open source. It'll be interoperable. Uh, it'll be entirely built on chain. And interfaces can be built in, a, in an hour uh, to feed into it. Um, it will not require like credit card or bank transfers for on ramps. It is being built completely native to Bitcoin, to Bitcoiners, and it can spread uh, in like in a fashion that like people can't imagine. I mean, we can look at it, right? Like WhatsApp sold to Facebook at what thirty employees. Instagram sold to Facebook at twelve employees. Binance surpassed the record to become a unicorn in three months in the summer of twenty seventeen. Um, so, you know, FTX managed to both get to 32 billion valuation in a two year period, which is faster than Facebook did it, right? If you look at some of the Forbes richest list, it's filled by crypto people, and that's without a scalable blockchain. 
So the idea is that this technology is so powerful that you can generate money so quickly. FTX lost a $40 billion valuation if you can buy FTX US versus FTX International, both $8 billion and $32 billion respectively. $40 billion of value was dis- was destroyed in a 72-hour period, straight to zero, right? You don't even have time. Like, I don't care if you're Sequoia Capital and you have great insight, you have a great track record of investing. You don't even have time to organize a phone call or have a last minute like meeting to try and bail it out. The thing was written off from 40 to zero. There's a, literally a letter from Sequoia writing to their LP. It's not like, hey, I'm writing off the investment to zero. Tomasic, I'm writing off the investment to zero. This is a huge uh, sovereign wealth fund type entity out of Singapore. The, this is this is like you can say they didn't do the due diligence, but like these are professional investors, right? So if it is possible for that amount of value to be both created and destroyed in that amount of time, and you have a completely scalable blockchain, I can I can agree with you that today it might be overpriced. Today nothing is cool is built on it, but the math tells you that it should grow faster than anything that has ever grown that that humans have ever observed is how Mm -hmm. quickly that that thing will grow. Now, if you require the the app to be in the Apple app store, obviously it can't grow like that because your app can get banned. you You can kind of think about what are the metrics that you're looking for, what are the attributes and qualities of this app, and then you can kind of profile like who is going to build that. Likely it'll be a single person or two person team, right? Like it'll be one or two people could be completely anonymous. They will build something and in a 48 hour period, um, it'll take off because mm. once you see something like it's all about, it's all about re- remember the price of something is just in the uh, eyes of the, believer okay so you can go like nothing about ftx.com changed during those 72 hours it still looks like a nice exchange but people don't want no part of it right as soon as something on bitcoin takes off during that 24 hours it's okay that there still needs to be more work to be done and whatever but if you show the world some attribute of the of this coin this ledger that you can do something that humanity's never seen before and it gets an uptake a little bit, like you will start to then be like, I'm sure more of these apps are coming. I'm sure more things are coming. Let me just buy this up. And then the trigger effect of BTC miners switching over, it's like, well, now I can't hold BTC. Think about it, BTC can trade at $15,000 without a use case beyond holding it, right? Then yeah. even if you just have a little use case that something crazy, you can still hold BSV. You can hold whatever other fat to be six chains too. So if the if there's a little bit of a boost, then you have a switch. This is not like fantasy porn. This is not like, like fantasy. I'm not fantasizing. I'm talking about reality here, right? Then right. the miners come over, they have the hash, you don't have time during a 24 hour period to even call like how do we add them back to scale btc you don't have time for that right maybe maybe today i own more btc than i own bsc i'm talking straight facts nothing to do with my portfolio and like if the miners switch over then what are you going to do as exchanges you immediately go from i can't allow bsv deposits to i need to i can't accept btc deposits because the miners have left I don't know if BTC is still safe for deposits and withdrawals. I got to switch that over. Then all of a sudden, the centralized exchanges are like, I can't have BTC as a base pair. I got to have BSV as the base pair because it's it's growing. So you basically siphon the entire, every single built up network effects of the entire mining industry and the entire cryptocurrency industry. Um, and on top of whatever was invented that triggered this hyper Bitcoinization. So it's a 24 hour period. And the person who does this, uh, who triggers it, you can be like, well, why don't they make a new chain? Well, if they make a new chain, 
they could start with a pre-mind, but they can't trigger something so violent, so so right. crazy exponential. And quite frankly, if this thing's trading at thirty dollars and it's going to end up trading at thirty thousand dollars in the span, span of twenty four hours, I guess you can just buy some and just build and launch your product. You don't really care at that point. You'll be insanely rich just buying like I don't know ten thousand dollars worth of this thing, and then after twenty four hours, it's worth like I don't know a hundred million dollars, right? Um, so this is a kind of like growth curves that human beings have never thought about. Uh, and it's positive contagion, like I said, and it's not negative contagion, which is a force that humanities had never seen before. It's interesting how only a SHA-256 uh, Bitcoin from the Genesis block has the capacity of doing something so disruptive. You're right. You know, uh, this cannot happen anywhere else. It's almost like the only thing that could topple Bitcoin would be another another chain within the Bitcoin protocol that uses SHA-256. Yeah, or you first show me that something else has already beaten the combined infrastructure of SHA-256, then I'll believe that narrative. But until SHA-256 still has the highest infrastructure, then I have to rationally tell you that it will be one of the SHA-256 chains. I'm not sure if it has to have the same Genesis block. I'm not completely sure of that, but I do think it has to share the same SHA-256 infrastructure. I see. Yeah. Jack. Cool. Awesome. Great conversation. Yeah. Um, we talked about everything. How long did we go? We went for a long time. Guys, uh, if you want to follow Jack Lou, follow him on Twitter. He's very he's highly opinionated. Um, yeah. And and Jack is 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 uh, working for that dream of an on-chain world. And thank you for doing that, sir. Um, it's just wild to me. I know you gotta go, but it's just it's wild to me how this dream of yours, this this big blocker dream, is to this day that which is the most aggressed upon in in, in the entire crypto space. And I think it, it it's because of of how powerful these ideas are. Like these are very powerful ideas, and in my opinion, arguably the most powerful of ideas because you're talking about you know, if you really follow the logic, you're talking about replacing Amazon and Google with Bitcoin. And that to me is wild. Thank you, Jack, for being with me and spending this time talking to me about, about what we really need. You know, we need to build on chain. We need to get, get away from these externalities. We can't allow the crypto, the Bitcoin that we love to be dependent on bankers anymore. Jack, any final words of wisdom? No, I just think the long-term trend as a final thought is just um, money was always made by centralizing power. And I think as a result of the invention of Bitcoin, progressively money will be made by helping hand more power to the individual, the family unit. And whatever your views may be, um, this is a math and physics uh, problem. It is not an opinion problem. It is not a political problem. It's just someone invented something. Uh, and you know, like all, everything you use every day, any good or service is made by a person or, or people. Uh, it's just, there was no way to attribute to them um, their worth and have value uh, be given to them without also having a whole bunch of more value given to a centralized platform, whether that be big tech or big banking or big state. Um, and something was invented. It's not my dream. I'm just interpreting what was invented. Uh, and basically that's kind of, everything will make sense to you once you know that like that's the inversion that was invented and everything in between are basically frogs in boiling water trying to leverage what was invented to escape the reality of what was invented. And mm -hmm. ultimately, I think as a believer in math and science um, and physics, like the reality will come back uh, and we're seeing that play out and enjoy the journey. Don't put any stress on yourself. Like you don't, th this is an ETF on human productivity. Like this is not an ETF. This is not Jack's dream. This is not you betting on me or Raphael. This is just something that as long as the blocks are going, uh, is TikTok. Clock is ticking. Right on. Thank you, Jack. All right. Thanks, Raphael. Peace, love, anarchy, guys. Take care. <laughs> See ya.